Good evening, namaste, and a warm welcome to everyone present here today. We welcome you wholeheartedly to today's YES talk titled Flowing and Growing from I to I. Our speaker for today is Ms. Anamika Singh. And although anything I uh, speak about her might be falling short to describe her personality, but here is a small introduction about her. Ms. Anamika Singh, founder of Ada and Eye to Eye Wellness Journey, is acclaimed across the nation for her traditionally Indian yet refreshingly modern dance style. Her repertoire spans direction, choreography and performances for internationally reputed events, TV commercials, films and more. Further knowledge of hypnotherapy and meditation, together with her experience as an artist, teacher and mentor, has enriched her understanding, expression and communication of human behavior and emotion. This is reflected in all aspects of her work and being and has led to many embarking on a holistic journey with her to their optimum selves. Without taking much of your time, Anamika ma'am, we are honored that you are here with us today and you'll be sharing some beautiful insights and we are looking forward to uh, your talk. And now I invite you to please take over the podium and address the gathering. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your esteemed presence. Thank you for being in the space with me today for us to share a journey together. I strongly and strongly believe that the most precious thing we can give to each other is our time. So thank you for giving me your precious time and being present here to just be a part of a little glimpse of my journey that I have had. Before I say anything, I have to pay my respects to Ma, the mother, to Sri Aurobindo, under whose guidance I have found my wings. I was all of three and a half years old when I stepped into that sacred space called Meera Nursery. And I spent 14 years of my life up till class 12th in our divine abode. And I don't think I would be half the person I am or I would have had the journey I have had if I was not nurtured and nourished in our beautiful garden of love. I've been very, very privileged to receive beautiful, holistic education, which is most critical for any human. We all progress in our lives, making a list of things that we need to do. Go to a school, get good marks, go to a good college, figure out our future, get a good job, everything. And it's an endless list of desires and of the to-do tasks in our human life. But what is essential is for us to be plugged to that divine source that keeps us intact, that keeps us afloat across our life. So of course, many things you learn in school, many things that we learn from our seniors, from our juniors, from nature, but the most essential part I truly, truly believe and I only hope to strive and live is to embrace divinity in this human life. Because that is our only and only purpose. No matter what costumes we are wearing, I'm a dancer, so of course, costumes have been an integral part of all my performances. You know, depending on what role you're playing on stage, are you Radha? Are you Krishna? Are you playing Meera? 
Are you playing a beautiful child lost in a garden? Are you playing a king, a conqueror? The different things that we project and portray require different costumes, require different language, different culture, but that beautiful soul within is one. And somewhere we forget that. Somewhere we get so embroiled in the roles and responsibilities in our life that we start believing that is what we are. And the little that I can share about my eye to eye journey, that it's been a constant effort to learn and unlearn. That a lot of things that we are learning are applicable in that moment, are applicable in that given situation. And sometimes we have to unlearn all that, um, all those formulas and all those ways of being when we move into another space. And um, that's all I've been trying to do all my life. And uh, it's, it's a great, great, great privilege to be in this space today also because tomorrow is our school's Founders Day. 23rd of April is when the Mother's International School was born. And coincidentally or serendipitously, every year on the 23rd of April, we would have a talent fiesta, an annual talent fiesta where students would come and share their art or their hobby and their passion and bring something up on stage. And I think somewhere the birth of the choreographer in me, the birth of the director in me happened right then. That's where I got to know I was a dancer. That's where I even learned that I was a choreographer. We don't even know the capabilities we hold within, the beautiful qualities we hold within till we are given an opportunity to showcase them. So I don't see this as a mere accident that today I'm here for this beautiful session with all of you and um, and completing a full circle. It's been 25 years since I passed out of school. I'm from the 1998 batch. And soon after, I started my own dance academy by the name of Ada, Anamika's Dance and Arts Academy. I know it wasn't this thought of plan. It's not uh, something that I was working towards. It's just something that happened what was meant to be a little summer love story with a little workshop happening with neighborhood children, I didn't know would turn out to be this eternal love affair that I will just not be able to step out of it. And I don't think it's possible for us to make our journeys by ourselves with the limited knowledge, the limited thinking that we have. I think a lot of people a lot of experiences that get added to us somewhere drive that beautiful story of us. So a few highlights I thought I'd bring here that one of the most critical things that I learned as a dancer is the joy of the art, the joy of expression, the joy of giving, the joy of offering. Somewhere we get enveloped in this concept of appreciation and accolades for whatever we are doing. And I think somewhere that takes away the joy. So I was this little girl and I would not leave one opportunity to express myself through dance. My grandparents very patiently sat every single day looking at me, marveling at what I would do. And somewhere I think that encouragement made me believe I was a good dancer. But my sharing was not reward based. It was not what I was getting in return. It was simply the joy of dancing every day after school, in school, uh, at any opportunities that we would have, any stage work that we would have, and I would be up not caring if I had the central role, if I was the main lead, because 
simply to be part of that bigger world and be able to express oneself was unmatched. And I think that I may have been running my academy for 25 years now. And yes, I've launched 25 dance forms, but somewhere for me, it's never been important to get that appreciation from the outside. So when I was dancing in school, I was asked, okay, what are you going to make of life? Because this is good as a hobby. It's good as passion. It's wonderful. You do well. But what are you going to do in life? What career path have you chosen? And I didn't have a perfect answer. I didn't have a specific goal. I just knew that, as the mother says, give your 100% to everything. And I know that that is what I did. I was a good student, not a topper, above average. And somewhere, I didn't really muddle up my life thinking that that is the only aim I have as a child, to score marks. And somewhere, I also give that credit to my family, my parents, my grandparents, who did not have these uh, big expectations of you have to do this and you. And why I bring this up today is because a lot of times our own expectation of ourselves, expectation of others around us actually detours us from our path. So somewhere the fact that my seniors recognized my skill. Of course, as a four-year-old child, I couldn't have gone and enrolled myself in a Kathak class. I couldn't have just gone to a teacher and expressed the desire of being on stage. Somewhere, they identified that and they nurtured that in me. And I can never, ever, ever express my gratitude enough. And somewhere, I think that is the role we all have to play in each other's lives, to encourage each other's uniqueness. Not everybody is meant to be a certain way. Not everybody is meant to perform in life in certain segments or score in a certain area. We are all beautiful divine beings. And I know it's very cliched, but we don't expect a fish to fly and a bird to swim in water. We just accept that they belong to different spaces. We expect one flower to blossom in one season, one in another. The colors, the shapes, the sizes, so many things that, that are different in this world, they are beautiful for their uniqueness. But somewhere we try and typecast humans in that. And this is what the eye to eye journey is all about. How important it is for us to respect our individuality, our small I individual self, and be part of that larger whole, the infinite oneness. And that can only and only happen when we are able to accept who we are. We are able to look at our fears, our insecurities, our doubts in the face. We're able to brave our challenges and look at our small eye issues in the eye because that is exactly where our big eye immunity lies. Any crisis, any challenge, any obstacle is only and only an opportunity of growth for us. And these are not just big words that I'm speaking. I'm going to go back a little bit into my story that today, uh, yes, I've performed in very, very prestigious events. I've had the opportunity to dance in beautiful spaces, whether it's performing in Kargil after the Kargil War as a tribute to our soldiers, whether it's dancing in Bodh Gaya, the Mecca of Buddhism, where Lord Buddha meditated and was enlightened, dancing in the Red Fort, the only ever show to happen after Shah Jahan, so after 350 years, 
many, many such beautiful opportunities that happened. But I don't think I can be defined by these successes of my life if I don't honor my failures, if I don't honor my pitfalls, I don't honor the dents along the way. So growing up in a beautiful, secure family, and again, this is possibly destiny that I was born in a family which was secular, respecting all faiths, all religions, respecting one another, respecting humans. It was not important for us to memorize mantras and chants and know uh, passages from the Guru Granth Sahib or know ayats of the Quran Sharif, no. But what was important was for us to imbibe that divinity, for us to learn the beautiful wisdom of the masters, of the gurus, of the beautiful philosophers who have walked on the same planet all of us are walking on today, breathing the same air we breathe today. And again, I'm highlighting this point because somewhere we get so ritualistic in our practices and we get so limited by the definition of our religion, our way of being, our way of thinking, that we start separating ourselves. Then how can we possibly merge eye to eye? As unique as we are, we are also part of the same whole. So if we are out there looking for differences, we'll find plenty. But if we are out there looking for the beautiful similarities that connect one human to another, one creature to another, how we are all part of this beautiful nature, we'll always and always find our space expanded. So deep gratitude to the divine for planting me in a family which encouraged that, which nurtured me to grasp and learn from every space. Also going to a school which had exactly the same philosophy, the same ethos. I remember I was very, very, very active in the school assemblies and we would have beautiful bhajans, we would have beautiful shabads, we would have recitations every day. And whether it was the works of the mother, the Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vivekananda, uh, passages from different scriptures, different philosophies, and that's what exposed us to learning more and knowing that all paths lead to the one. That everybody, every guru, every master, every philosopher may have chosen different words, may have chosen a different way of expression, but the ultimate goal for us is to be plugged within and to be plugged with the divine. So I feel a lot of work that I'm doing today in the eye to eye space has its deep rooted foundations of how I was nurtured as a little seed. And I say this because I think that is the responsibility we all hold today as humans. When we see a lot of news in, in the newspapers, on the television, which doesn't sit right when we look at violence happening, somewhere we have to take that responsibility. We can't simply turn off our televisions and turn the paper away saying, I can't deal with this negativity. Somewhere it is our responsibility, our responsibility as individuals on what is our line of thought? What are we speaking? What are we teaching our children? What is the conversation we are having with our friends? Some of the beautiful instances that I'd like to bring here. I was traveling and I was in London three years ago before the pandemic. And to my surprise, I was navigated to a church for a Sunday mass. So before I get into that story, one of the practices 
that I always have when I visit a country or a city or village is to always and always make my offerings and pay my respects at the place of faith. Whether it's a mandir, a darga, a gurdwara, a church, synagogue, wherever. Because I feel that is the one place where we all strip ourselves of the external identities we hold, irrespective of whether we've come in a fancy car or on a cycle or walking, the clothes we are wearing, whatever. Somewhere we are all directed to that space, knowing that there is some higher power, something which is beyond us. And it humbles us. So I was there in London and I thought someday I must attend a beautiful Sunday mass. And I asked a beautiful couple I had met and they'd only met me very briefly. One directed me to the Westminster Abbey, which is also one of the big tourist destinations. But his wife shared that I don't know Anamika too well, but knowing the little about her in the, in the last few minutes that I've learned, maybe she should go to a more quaint, quiet place. And I was directed to a church. And to my surprise, when I walked in there, everybody was greeting with folded hands in Namaste. And I was a little surprised because obviously they were all from different color, different backgrounds, different nations, but it was very heartwarming. I went in and even before I could sit, a beautiful person walked in giving me a hymn book and asked me to sing along. And I could barely sing when they started their prayers because I was so overwhelmed with every word that was written there. I don't think I'd ever attended a full mass and read through every piece of um, work that is available in the churches. But, or maybe I was operating from a different awareness at the time. So every word penetrated deep in. After which, the reverend of the church comes in and he looks at the audience and he says that there are a lot of new faces here. Why don't you introduce yourself, your names, your countries? And we all stood up one by one. It was just a small gathering of about 70, 80 people. And after we introduced ourselves, he said, now let's say a prayer. Let's say a prayer for the rivers to be full in all these countries, for there to be food on every table in all these countries, for everybody to heal in all these countries. And I couldn't stop my tears from flowing because isn't that our eye to eye journey? Connecting with one another. And it may have been a different country, a new place of prayer, strangers, but in no time, it became home. It became home for me. And to my surprise, the same day, they wanted some volunteers for an evening event. And what was this evening event? The Ramzan was going on, and today is Eid. So the Ramzan was going on and they wanted volunteers to distribute dates and water because many, many Muslim brothers and sisters were to break their roza there. And this was all in a church. And that reaffirmed faith in faith for me. That isn't this what we are meant to do. No matter what our beliefs are, but shouldn't we just let our doors open and invite more and more people in this space? I'm going to move on to another story. Another story from last year. I was in Ladakh. I'd gone to Ladakh to spend 10 days and do Vipassana meditation in silence, in solitude. But I didn't know that there was so much richness that was waiting for me. So many blessings waiting to immerse me. So after I finished the 10 days Vipassana, 
I learned that it was the most significant month in the Buddhist calendar. When I went there, I simply went according to the dates of the course. But I learned that I'd stepped there on the same day the new lunar calendar had started, the first calendar in the Buddhist month. And for them, again, just like Ramzan, just like our Navratras, it's the most sacred time where all of the region is in prayer. They believe the gates, the bardo opens, and that's the time to pray, to seek forgiveness, to offer love, healing, compassion for all of humanity to benefit. So it's not only for their community that they're praying, not just for their region that they're praying, but all of the creation. I didn't know this when I had landed there. But soon after my space of silence, I learned about it and I decided to stay on for that month, to be in that high vibration space, to learn and to be able to grow. And it was, it was divine orchestration, how I was led from one space to another, one monastery to another, without having an itinerary, without having a wish list, how I was lifted in my interaction with people, with locals, some of them not even knowing Hindi or English well, but how I was transported to these beautiful monasteries from the 12th century, 13th century, and, and to be able to see how the monks at the time would have even created this place of prayer. Today we have the roads, we have a lot of uh, the infrastructure that enables us to visit these spaces. I can't even imagine how it would have happened 500, 700, 800 years back. How they would have loved their food, loved their water to those spaces, sat down and meditated. And truly, those spaces vibrate with that frequency. You can't help but shed all your layers. When I was in that space, I was not a man or a woman. I was not from one religion or one faith. I was not the resident of one city or one country. I just experienced that soul consciousness with every bit of that space, this, every speck of that space communicating with me. How I was led to a monastery and they all, they have a lamp room where people light lamps uh, when they ask for a mannat, when they have a certain desire. And uh, the only one lamp that the monastery lights every year. And it, it takes almost about 365 days for this lamp to completely get consumed, approximately a year. And it's during this beautiful, sacred, pious time that they light it. It so happened, I happened to reach that monastery on that day when they were to light it. And I still don't know why, but I was given the responsibility of lighting that lamp that day, of filling that lamp. And they asked me, the monks asked me, whatever you want to desire, why don't you tell us? We will chant that for you and it will certainly come true. And I know I speak not just for myself, but possibly all of you here, that we, when we are in the space of oneness, when we are in the space of higher consciousness, how can we have a desire at all? How can we possibly have these small, trivial aspirations of ours to be fulfilled? Because you know you're actually sitting in that ocean of blessings. You're sitting in that ocean of love. So together, we chanted for world peace. Soon after, there were these little lamas who walked in. And uh, I had the great fortune of distributing their meal that day, of offering them lunch that day, langar that day. 
Now that's a practice that I, I've had the great fortune of doing in Gurdwaras because as a child, my grandparents would encourage me to come along with them, distribute food, and, and it was ingrained in us that any occasion, happy or sad, it's a space of giving, it's a space of gratitude, it's a space of understanding the higher presence. So by, by default, every occasion in our home, we used to go to a beautiful Gurdwara not very far off where there were these little underprivileged children who were given education, who were given um, a place to stay, everything, all their needs were taken care of. Simply for us to know that celebration only and only multiplies when we give. It's not about getting birthday gifts. It's not about what am I going to eat and how I am going to dress up, but how we are going to be able to share our joy, our joy of birth, our joy of breathing in that space. So, so many things that I have experienced in different places of faith got aligned. And there are endless stories that I can share. But somewhere, I feel belonging to a country, belonging to a country that we call India, and I have my own little definition of India, in India, that it's, it's a beautiful, sacred land where we learn to light our inner wisdom, light our inner candle, because it's only and only when we illuminate within can we offer that light to another. And with so many beautiful cultures, I've again been very fortunate to learn so many different dance forms, different folk dances, and celebrate the different festivals of different regions, whether it's Bihu from Assam, Bhumar from Rajasthan, Dandia from Gujarat, Lavni from Maharashtra, Bhangra from Punjab, so many different folk forms. And how they're so integrated with nature, how it's all about sharing that joy with one's community, sharing it further and further. So why limit ourselves? Why limit ourselves in our thinking? Why limit ourselves in only practicing a few rules and regulations and, and, and few philosophies when we have this abundance. And doesn't this become the opportunity of every person living in this country to then further connect with more and more, irrespective of which state we are in, which country we are in, that beautiful, radiant connection with the divine always and always stays alive. We've all gone through the pandemic together. Did we really care where a particular medicine is made or which faith one doctor belonged to or who was taking care of us in a certain place? Who is farming for us? Who is bringing us the clothes we wear, how does it matter? We are so integrated in our way of being, in our way of thinking. And this is what we have to empower ourselves with to spread more and more. Again, I didn't know life would take its twists and turns. When I was stepping out of school, like I said, it was not a plan for me to open my dance academy at the age of 17. It's just something that happened very organically. I didn't even know where that would go. I just knew that what I had, I wanted to share. And as I shared, I kept learning more. So I have always and always been a student 
of dance, student of life, to imbibe more and more, to be able to share further and more. But I do remember that when I started my classes back in 98, a lot of people around would ask me, okay, so how are your classes going? And, um, and I'd say very well, great. But now what work are you doing? What is your job? So it took forever to, for people to actually believe that that's my profession, that's my purpose, that's my path. And just when everything in Ada was, um, had reached its great heights with all these shows at the international level and many, many beautiful um, external success that an artist can be bestowed with, I went into another direction where I felt that only a certain people in the audience, a certain people who have the means to enroll themselves in my classes or buy a ticket to my show or are present in a certain atmosphere can actually avail what I'm offering. And I have more work to do. And that was the birth of Eye to Eye, where I started working with the underprivileged children, sp started working with the specially abled, started working with rape survivors. And now very recently, my work with the Indian Army. And again, I have to share that it is not something I aspired. It is not a tiny little desire of a girl, an artist that plugged me into these spaces. It's not always moving from our small eye space to the big eye space. Sometimes it also works in reverse. And that's when we believe we are the chosen ones. So beautiful opportunities started coming forth. And when I share this, I share it in all my humility, not trying to brag about doing work in these spaces, but knowing the amount of work I have to do, the amount of learning, amount of wisdom, the amount of guidance that was resting in all these spaces for me. When I started working with these young adults who are on the wheelchairs since birth, I learned resilience from them. I learned acceptance from them. They're not people who are going to suddenly get up and start doing things in their life physically, but how beautifully they have navigated their small eye issues, not seeing their condition uh, from a victim mode, but seeing the opportunities it creates for them. And when I do my classes with them, when we share time together, I see them liberated. I see them dance better than any of us skilled dancers. Because the skilled dancer will need a lot of makeup and costume and mudras and, and planning and choreography. But for them, it's simply the joy of being alive, the joy of breathing, the joy of just sharing space, sharing what they can do, even in that limited surrounding, limited condition. So I think I have progressed in my eye to eye journey when I work with them. I was in Maharashtra in a flood struck place, Kolapur, Sangli, and uh, facilitating eye to eye workshops. And what could I do? Could I bring back their houses that had been washed away, all their savings, everything that they had created? I met two little children there, two little girls who were playing on the rubble of their house that was completely devastated. And I asked them, I said, are you sad? 
and they said yes but we are also excited about the new house that will get made and you know ma'am that that's what i want to become they didn't know the word architect they just said you know we want to become uh, that uh, that specialist wo jo hote hai na jo ghar banate hain taki hum bahut mazboot ghar banayenge taki agli baar ghar tootenge nahi jab baad aayegi that we want to empower ourselves educate ourselves learn to be able to build houses that are not going to be washed away in the floods and that strengthened my faith that is what fueled my faith that how quickly we give up on our own dreams how quickly we give up on our own aspirations our lives our goals because there is some destruction that happens that some devastation that happens which is so temporary and transient maybe maybe that is creating the fuel not maybe why am i even using the word maybe it is most certainly building us building our immunity to pick up our pieces and grow so every time i find myself a little jittery i find myself falling off the chart i plug into these beautiful travels i plug into the beautiful experiences that the divine has specially orchestrated for me to learn from i cannot help but share the story of a beautiful woman the woman who is the mother of one of my children my student he was all of four in fact he was also from the mothers international school when he came into my life came into ada a very naughty very bright very charming boy and his mother would call me yashoda ma that yeah you know all these children love being in your space because you don't scold them and i said that's not true i'm a very strict teacher i do she said yeah but they come into your space and they are just running around and making noise and 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 i always used to feel that you know everywhere these children are being disciplined disciplined in school disciplined at home don't do this don't do that this is the way to be where do they just get to be themselves so the first 10 minutes of every class these children were allowed to run and make noise and exhaust all that pent up energy and then they would listen they would listen because they had this immense trust that i'm not going to condition them and i'm not going to pull their energy down that tomorrow when they come for their class again they are going to be allowed to do that but now it's time to learn so coming back to this beautiful child unfortunately he was diagnosed with a very rare condition a stomach issue and we lost him at the age of 12 his mother who had nursed him for the last 4 years she was a bag of bones lifeless relentlessly crying had lost all hope in life her only and only objective was to take care of this child and help him heal and the desire was not met in the same way as she planned and i remember 2013 feb when this boy became one with light i was performing at the mahakum that year and it is after my performance and incidentally i was performing the life of krishna and i would call this boy krishna and it's only after my performance i learned about him and i don't know what took upon me but a few days later i met his mother and i shared that we are planning a beautiful show a beautiful performance celebrating the spirit of the woman and i want you to be on stage and this lifeless mother looked at me saying really i've just lost my child you want me to dance and i said yes let that anger flow anger towards god 
anger towards yourself, anger towards your child for leaving you, anger towards the world, whatever. The, the grief, the anger, the pain, the suffering that you're holding in, let it flow. Every day I would connect with her and try to convince her. And one fine day she listened and she came to the studio. We played a song which was essentially questioning the divine on why you have chosen me for this suffering. And every single day she would cry and I would cry and she would go back. And then after a few days, something flowed. And do I call it a dance? Yes. It is a cosmic dance because we can't just relate with life with all the happy, good, positive emotions as we see them. Everything that is created by the divine, as we may see as good and bad, happy, sad, ugly, beautiful, life, death, darkness, light, it's all there to serve a purpose. How can a seed grow if it's not met with the darkness and buried under the soil? So, so much of that. And somewhere, this pain of this woman was channeled and she was up on stage. Today, she is a beautiful counselor. Ten years past, she has channeled her suffering, her pain, making her eye-to-eye -eye journey, using her small eye issues to build her big eye immunity. Can her child come back? No. Can her situation change? No. But her way of looking at life changed. And as she changed, bringing that inner transformation, metamorphosing from why me to why not me? That she's been able to lend her energy. I can sit here day and night sharing about the innumerous inspirations I've had in life. I feel that when every student has walked into other, a child, a grown up, including one 88 year old lady who's currently doing her sessions, her healing sessions, and what are these sessions? She comes to sit and meditate. She feels this is the last leg of her life. And if there is any negativity she's holding, any toxins she's holding, any questions, doubts that she's holding, she wants to melt them away. And for her to trust a woman who is half her age, even more than that, that teaches me humility. So every student who's walked in, young or old, every place I've visited, in the rural spaces, in the urban spaces, every experience I've had, and I'm not going to limit them to saying were they happy experiences or sad experiences or were they celebratory experiences. No, just experiences of different kinds of different nature that have allowed me to see the divine in different forms, in different ways. Why do we think that the divine can only look a certain way? When we pray in the Navratras, we celebrate all forms of Ma. When we celebrate different festivals, we are celebrating all that they hold within. And this brings me to the beginning of my story to end today's session, that I don't think that I could have borne these beautiful fruits, these beautiful flowers, had I not been embedded deep underground. 17, I passed out of school. 17, Ada was born. But a year before that, at the age of 16, I attempted suicide. 
And without delving into too much detail and backstory, like I said, I belong to a beautiful family, had a beautiful school nourishing me. And somewhere I feel that my story is very similar to the Buddha's. How the Buddha was in a beautiful palace and shown everything that was perfect in life. But when he stepped out, he saw misery. He saw poverty, sickness, death, and learned that all of this is the truth of life. Ultimately, no matter who we are, what we are, we are going to all experience this in different degrees and different forms. And that's what helped him move on to his path of enlightenment. Well, he was the Buddha, the enlightened one. I was this little 16-year-old girl who didn't know much at that time. So, as you already know now, I was always dancing around and in my own dream world. And when I came into class 11, so of course, you know, the regular pressure from school and the home and parents, you know, come on, you know, you are going to go into the big bad world. What are you going to do with life? Uh, what is the direction you are taking? What's the profession? You must up your general knowledge, know about world affairs, current affairs, everything. So you must read the newspapers. Back then, there was the only exposure that we had was newspapers and samachar in the evening. So morning akbar, sham ko samachar. You have to devote that time and learn about the world affairs. And when I opened the papers, what did I read? Iraq war. Kashmir issues, rapes, murders, theft, robberies, uh, your own brother killing uh, somebody for a property, etc., etc. Not that today it's different, but for a 16-year-old child, it was too much. It was just too overwhelming that, oh, this is the big bad world people talk about. This is where I have to go. I don't want to. I don't want to be part of this world. I love God. I love my Krishna, my Shiva, my Vahiguru, my Christ, Matarani, my beautiful gurus, my masters. I love all of you. And I know you're all part of that, some world up there. And I want to be part of that world. I don't want to live in this dark human space. And I decided to end my life. But, well, it was the most successful failure of my life. So failures can be very good. Because had I not failed at the time and succeeded, I would not be sitting here and talking for the last 53 minutes. So yes, it was the most successful failure. And had I not experienced that darkness, had I not experienced that hurt, that suffering, at that time, those questions unanswered, why things happen in a certain way, why do there have to be evil people in the world? Why can't God only create goodness? Why do there have to be terrorists? Why does there have to be violence? Why are there wars? All the questions that are still unanswered. But in these 25 years, the one thing I learned, and actually that is what became the foundation of Ada, is you're too little to change the world, but you're too powerful to change yourself. So if we look at wanting to bring a change to 8 billion people and this big magnum opus, magnanimous world, we'll never know where to start. But if we have the faith and if we have the strength and the courage to plug into ourselves, saying, I'm here. I'm breathing when every single moment so many people have breathed their last breath. I'm still alive. We're still here listening. We're still here talking. We're still here eating, looking at another sunset, waking up another day, going through our pain, going through our medical issues, going through our relationship issues, but alive. The fact that we are alive, change can happen. And it has to happen. That is the only reason we are breathing. To bring that 
in our transformation, moving from our small eye to the big eye. Do not ask God, why me? Asking, can I even handle it? But say, really me? You think I can do this? Let's go for it. And I know I, these are talks that we've heard. We've all heard you know, different scriptures. There are so many positive talks and everything online. Imagine, imagine God is reorienting you know, himself, herself to reach us at home. Today, we don't have to necessarily go and read big scriptures every day. We can simply Google and know the meaning of a small little passage and imbibe its essence. We don't have to learn everything. We don't have to walk on these big mountains like the Guru Nanaks, the Buddhas, the Christs, hanging on a cross. No. All that wisdom, all that beautiful guidance is available to us on our fingertips. Whether it's raining, whether it's summer, winter, snowing, scorching heat, we can be sitting in our comfortable homes, accessing so much information, so much guidance, and still we fall, and still we fail, and still we get disconnected, and still we choose violence, and still we are separating ourselves from one another. How unfortunate. How unfortunate for us to lose this life drop by drop, breath after breath. It is our responsibility. Every time we read a piece of news that doesn't gel well here, don't flip the paper. Sit with that news and say, I need to sit and meditate more today. So I don't become this. So I don't create this violence. So I don't spread this negativity. I need to pray a little more today because there are so many more people in pain. And I have the power to pray. Because the days I'm in pain, there are others praying for me. There are others meditating for world peace. There are others who are channeling harmony for us to survive. How beautiful that we have so much available to us. We don't have to grow our own crop. We don't have to weave our own cloth. We have to do nothing. With all this available to us, all we have to do is just be good and kind to ourselves. Good and kind to one another. To learn from each other. To grow with each other. To flow on our eye-to-eye -eye journey. Let us fall. Let us fail. Let us feel anger, hurt, pain. The idea is not to block these. The idea is to sit with these emotions, understand what is the source? Where is it stemming from? Can I reach one layer deeper, one layer deeper, one layer deeper? And the deeper we go, we realize that all that there exists is love. So I could be sharing this love through dance. You could be doing it through painting. Somebody else could be doing it through their writing. Somebody else is doing it by nurturing their family at home. Everyone has a role to play. The tiniest part of a big machine going missing will disable that machine to work. Even one of us missing from this planet today will have the entire system collapse. The fact that you and me are breathing today, you and me are living today, we must bring that aliveness that awareness, that awakening into execution and say yes to life. Yoga is a way of being. That is what Sri Aurobindo said. It is not as we understand a few asanas you do and pranayam you do. No, it's our constant awareness of where I am, where I need to go. Bettering myself, learning more and more, leaving what is not required grasping to move into a higher, better, healthier, healed space. Education is not just about getting degrees. Education is us standing up for our own rights, for us to stand up for each other as humans, for us 
to take care of our well-being, the well-being of people around, the well-being of this entire creation, nature. What are we planting back? So much we are taking from nature, rent-free. The sun is shining for us, the moon is shining, the stars are out, the flowers are blossoming, those forests that are full without you and me going and watering them. What are we giving back? Can we offer gratitude? Can we care for our planet, care for each other? That is the highest education we need to have. And what is spirituality? Spirituality is not binding and limiting ourselves in a certain line of thought, but giving ourselves the opportunity to grow and expand, to be the sky, to be the earth, to be the water, to be the fire, to be the air. Imbibe all the panchatattvas, the five elements, and allow different formations to happen, different course to take forward for us to know how much more we are capable of. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, for channeling your awareness, your wisdom, your guidance, because each one of you who's sitting here is somewhere saying yes to life. Somewhere sitting here, not to hear me, not to get my insight, not to judge me, not to have an opinion about me. I'll be lost in the big world. Tomorrow there will be a new talk. Today there will be some new food that we will eat. This will become stale and old. But for all of us as a collective consciousness to flow and grow from eye to eye. From our issues to our big eye immunity, from our individual self to the big eye infinite oneness. Thank you, ma'am. In fact, uh, even listening to you talk is as graceful as an artist, like magnificent artist like you performing a dance on the stage. It was such an incredible uh, flow of thoughts and so graceful, so elegant. I really feel uh, short of words to describe how it was and such amazing, inspiring thoughts. As you can see in the chat box, there are lots of accolades and you know, lots of compliments for you. There are a few questions from some of our listeners and I would like to take those. So the first question is, <clears throat> the feeling of oneness lasts for uh, just a few seconds, probably maximum five to seven minutes. And sometimes I find that feeling of oneness in silence, music or nature. So how can I increase that feeling of oneness to a longer duration? Wonderful. Thank you uh, for this wonderful question. Firstly, I'd like to say, it, yes, it is so true that this feeling lasts only for a few seconds because that radiance of the sun, we are not even equipped to handle that in all its magnanimity. So the more we expand within, the more space we create for this oneness to penetrate. And the beautiful thing is we don't have to get discouraged that it lasts only a few seconds because for all of us, it is so. We do give in to our subtle ego. We all do give in to uh, the, the not so um, healthy emotions. But in this form, in this body form, we have had masters across different times and ages, across different civilizations in different parts of the world, whether we talk about the mother, Sri Aurobindo, we talk about the, so many saints, Rumi and Shams Tabriz, we talk about the prophet, we talk about people from different ideologies who have all walked in the same sphere, with, in much, much more difficult conditions, physical conditions, more mental conditions. Today, we have so much available. So what do we do? So I um, maybe I can share a little quick. I'm not going to take too much time, but 
top 10 things and I'm going to see what comes up. What can we do to plug ourselves into oneness? One, explore the learnings and wisdom from different spaces and philosophy. Even when we have our favorite dish, we can't eat it three times a day and 365 days. Sometimes we need the same knowledge, the same wisdom in another form. So let us expose ourselves to more and more philosophies. And that plugs us into oneness. When we learn that whether you say it like this or that, whether I dance the Kathak or the ballet, when I'm taking a pirouette, I'm feeling one. So let us leave the form and imbibe qualities of different beautiful ideologies, religions, faiths, philosophies. One. Second, travel. In whichever capacity, whether it's in our own space, in our own city, villages, country, whatever, how, whatever we can afford. But when we travel, we learn that we may be very different in our geographical setting, but our joy is the same and so is our suffering. That is what connects us to people. Whether we are mourning sitting in a pal palatial house or sitting on the banks of a river or on a street side, when we lose something, we all hurt. When we receive something, we all rejoice, whatever that form is. So the more we travel, the more we connect with people, the more we learn about others, not just our few five, seven friends and our 10 relatives, more and more. That's what books do to us. But not just sitting and reading books or seeing films, but having conversation. And that brings me to the third point. Conversation with strangers. Whether you're at a bus stop, metro station, airport, hospital, restaurant, don't just communicate with people that you know. Step out. Have a conversation. Some of the most soulful, beautiful, meaningful conversations I've had are on my travels. In a local bus in Ladakh, on a ferry in some country, on a train ride, on a flight, sitting next to a, a river in different spaces and learned so much. So converse with strangers and you learn there is no stranger and that will connect you more and more to that oneness, to that beautiful divinity. Fourth, to have a habit, I think we need to inculcate the habit of um, you know, developing some art form. Music, painting, drawing, writing, pottery, whatever it is. It connects us beyond even our human self. Because when we are in touch with our own feelings, any art, any art, good, bad, happy, sad, whatever it is born out of, it connects us and plugs us more and more to our truth. And it helps us connect with more. We appreciate others' works, others' art also. And we all have our own version and our own perception of things. And that connects us to that oneness, that somebody may have created it from a different space. We don't know what that artist meant, what this poet meant. But even today, thousands of years later, that those words mean so much to us. That plugs us into oneness. Sports, any sport, whether it's stationary, it's moving. When we are in a team, when we play together, we learn how to brave failures together. We learn how to help each other. And that strengthens this oneness. This one mission, one goal, even if you're playing against a team, but the sportsman spirit, somewhere that helps us connect more. Joy of giving, irrespective of what we have in our life. Not all of us can do charity in money. Some of us, can do charity in our kindness. Some of us do it in our homes. Some of us help another person, educating another person, whatever. 
there is always and always something for us to give to offer there is something we are made of that can come to use for another so the joy of giving connects us to oneness and it's either or because i mean it's 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 the other way around as well when we receive that we feel connected that how somebody is helping us without knowing me how somebody assisted me without any motive that joy of doing things without a reward or a purpose in mind but simply for the joy of giving physical fitness somewhere if we don't take care of our body we are separating ourselves from the strongest tool that we have how can we feel oneness with others if you are not even feeling oneness with our body so take care of the body nurture itself nurture well eat well exercise well whatever whichever way slow more less doesn't matter but taking care of our bodies allows us to integrate our physical self and connects us to people around next coming mental self that we can't just beautify our body we spend so much time whether it's cleansing the body adorning it with costume jewels whatever it is making our hair hair cut whatever it is we have to do the same thing with our mind we have to make time for meditation for stillness if we don't enjoy our own company how are we expecting others to sit with us to enjoy our time to our energy so we have to start taking care of ourselves well i think we are done with nine the the tenth one would be hunger hunger to learn when we feel we know enough there is no oneness there is isolation because i will only work and operate out of my energy but the moment i'm ready to learn from the environment from nature i'm plugging into that oneness wow i didn't know these i hope i hope somebody has made a note of these top 10 things and i can use them too but i hope i hope that helps this really helps and uh, you brought in uh, this answer in such a beautiful perspective and this conversation is being recorded we'll be uploading it on our youtube so all of us will be going back to listening to this and we'll make a list of this in our journals but amazing really loved hearing all these points that you shared ma'am this one more question here in the chat box and that is um the participant would like to hear your views about oh. traditional dance forms which are shown in certain movies she has mentioned some movies kantara bhutakola these are some ritual majestic dances of india to be specified um, and you know also dancers who claim to be voices or vocals of god devotees around them feel the presence of god when they perform these dance forms or the kul deva in front of them so uh, they would like to hear your thoughts on this question what is not divine let us first explore that we are asking a question with respect to one art form ask a musician ask a painter ask a sculptor you know there's a beautiful saying when the dancer disappears and all that remains is dance is when we are one with the divine because till the time we are not ready to shed our identity there will always be separation so that point even in a performance or in a practice of course there it's a skill so the more we rehearse the more riyas we do the more practice enables us to polish these skills to learn the different techniques but that's only on the physical peripheral level beyond all this it is surrender every artist and i say it for possibly every artist who has breathed 
may have experienced great success at a worldly level or not. We are seeing stories of people, a lot of times the folk stories that come out in, in, uh, in, through poetry, in writing, in books, in movies, so many things that we are still learning. We'll never know. Also belonging to a country where the dialect changes every few hundred kilometers. The expression, the art form, the celebration, the festivity, so much changes. But ultimately, what is it all? For? It is a celebration of our human self. This is what plugs us to the divine when we are saying thank you to the divine for Eid. And gale mil rahe. what is that? What is that? It is that oneness. When we are doing a beautiful Ras Leela on stage, are we really Krishna? Are we really the gopis? Are we the Radha? Yes and no. We will never know. But we feel connected. We feel how can you be separate from me? That, that beautiful connect that we feel within, that we project that form. We project that divinity through us, whether it's a deity, whether it's a, a story, anything. The ultimate idea of any art and of any dance is for us to forget the ego self, to completely dissolve, to completely melt, to completely immerse oneself in the creation and the creator and submit oneself. So yes, that is possible for all of us and it's not necessary to be a classical dancer or a stage artist. Ask, I have so many beautiful people who come for classes, they're not performing anywhere. They're not standing on any stage. Nobody's buying a ticket to watch them, but they are dancing for themselves. And in that moment, they're celebrating their life irrespective of the suffering, the pain, the challenges, the obstacles, the hurdles. That celebration of the self is oneness. That celebration is divinity that connects us through different forms, different arts, different ways. Hey, thank you, ma'am. That was very well um, answered. And yeah, Isha, uh agrees that you answered a question very well. In fact, uh, we try to invoke the divine within ourselves through any rituals and um, it's very beautifully expressed. If anyone else would like to share any questions or reflections, you Even may please I feel free to. A two point that, you know, yes, especially in classical dances, why do we start with a Guru Vandana or Ganesh Vandana, Saraswati Vandana? It's not about a particular deity, God, goddess being present there. It is for us to know that everything begins and ends with the divine. So we invoke, when you use the word invocation, it came to me that we invoke that divinity within us, that whatever I'm offering is actually what you have gifted me. How can I offer to the divine anything other than myself that is also created by the creator? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Bijlani to share his thoughts and insights on this session um, to say a few words concluding the session. Sir, please. Thank you, Richa. Even if you had not asked me, I would have spoken and uh, to make sure, in fact, I sent you a message in the chat just now that I want to speak. I would have grabbed this opportunity. And thank you, Anamika, for a talk that uh, will be one of those most memorable talks, most unforgettable talks, which, uh, in fact, while it was going on, one kept wishing it should never stop. And if, thanks to modern technology, one would also like to listen to it again and again. Uh, in fact, uh, let me start with your name itself. I think uh, your destiny, which, of course, is uh, written well in advance before we arrive in this world, and a lot is guided by the homework that it did already in previous lives. Uh, 
<clears throat> the name itself speaks for that. Uh, Anamika, you had not to be identified in this life with a name. You know, the name is a restricting identity which restricts us to that small I. You are meant to be one with that larger self which cannot be restricted and limited in this way. Then, you know, your life has been full of coincidences. That again is uh, our uh, ignorant way of uh, uh, not necessarily seeing the hand of the divine and creating those coincidences. Uh, not only today, but uh, many other coincidences that you mentioned uh, throughout the talk. But uh, coming to today itself, the 25th anniversary of your graduating from the Mothers International School, the 25th anniversary of uh, founding uh, your academy, and uh, the fact that it happens to be Eid, and uh, so on. And uh, the date of the talk, when we fixed all this, we did not really think of. It was just to find a mutually convenient date. And yet it ended up having so many coincidences. And uh, in the fact that you are an alumna of the Mothers International School and uh, uh, expressed so much gratitude to uh, that school, and of course the uh, feeder school or uh, the uh, Mira Nursery, from where many uh, moved to the Mothers International School. Uh, now, of course, that preschool part is also merged with the Mothers International School itself. Uh, but anyway, so the gratitude that you expressed makes me all the more proud because uh, the school grew out of the Shurabindo Ashram Delhi branch, uh, which uh, has been my karma bhumi for more than 30 years now. And uh, uh, therefore, that really was. Uh, very heartwarming. And what you said about uh, the school was something again, which would be of great use to many because uh, uh, it's a very common thing what you talked about that it was in the school that uh, you discovered uh, that you could be a dancer, a choreographer, an artist and so on. And that in spite of that, there was some pressure, subtle pressure from here and there. Well, all those are good as hobbies, but what will you do? which means that we don't look upon them as a career. And uh, the fact that it turned out to be your career should again be something very inspiring because a real life example is always very inspiring. Uh, it has been your magnanimity to give so much uh, importance to the circumstances that you got in the family, in the school. And in a way, you kept emphasizing that with gratitude. Uh, you know, in uh, conventional terms, we call it uh, the nurture. But then we have all this, this uh, uh, conflict. What is more important, nature or nurture? Uh, you emphasize nurture, which certainly is important, but then nature is also important. You had it within you. And of course, that also we receive from the divine. And uh, the fact that uh, we put in all that homework in the previous lives is also the grace of the divine. And to give us appropriate circumstances in this life is also through divine grace. But all the same, the fact is that uh, the way you arrived in this world had a great deal to do with uh, what you ended up becoming. Uh -huh. Then, you know, this, uh, uh, what you talked about, uh, your experiences in different places of worship. This is again something which uh, was uh, uh, truly sort of uh, a unifying sort of a sentiment. And it's more than a sentiment because uh, all of us who have been to places of worship, not necessarily that of our faith, have experienced it. And if I may quickly recollect uh, uh, my experience, uh, in 1969, uh, I went to England as a young boy of 22, and I was in a medical college uh, surrounded by medical students. And the group that I be ended up becoming most friendly with, because they were the ones who were willing to receive me, was a group of devout Christian students. So they were all Christians, but there was a small group of the devout ones who tended to sit together. And that was the group which accepted me most easily. And with them, I made visits to church, churches, etc., and enjoyed the sermons, the way you said. And then I went again in 1985, 16 years later. And those days, we didn't, couldn't maintain contact the way we can do these days. So I'd lost, in, lost touch with all those students. But then I tried to uh, explore if I could meet some of them again in 1985, 16 years later through the medical school by writing to them. And they did put me in touch with two of them, the two who had become one. They got married to each other. 
So they were now a couple and that is the one they put me in touch with. And I contacted them during that 1985 visit. And once again, they invited me to a church. Before they said, you come to the church and then from there we'll together go and have lunch at home. So I went to the church and then they offered at the end of the uh, usual sermon that if anyone wants something for which we should pray, please tell us. Now it was 1985. The a uh, great, you know, air disaster uh, in which uh, many, uh, about 300 people had died. It was history. I mean, recent history at that time. It had just happened a few months back. I think it was a Pan Am flight. And uh, it was suspected that it was a terrorist attack which had done it. So I shared with them that I have a little fear of traveling. Of course, I've reached here safe, but then I have to travel back home. And I have an eight-year-old child. and uh, Therefore, uh, I would like you to pray that I be able to travel back safely and be with my daughter. And of course, many others also said many other things. And they prayed for each one of us. This is something which I really enjoyed in the Christian tradition. And uh, even if you don't ask for specifically that you pray for me for this particular thing, they do pray. And uh, I have very often now incorporated this in the type of uh, dhyana section of our meditation, in guided meditations, that let's pray for... Uh, those whom we like, for those whom we dislike. Let's pray for those who are affected by famines and floods or wars anywhere in the world and so on and so forth. Now, this is something which I picked up from the Christian tradition. And this really very sort of creates a great feeling of oneness. Uh, then, you know, uh, you again brought out your spiritual journey, brought out one more important thing that yes, uh, we should fulfill ourselves through the type of unique talents and gifts that we have received. And uh, you had received that, that in the area of particularly dancing. And you created an academy which uh, became perhaps even more successful than you had imagined. Made a small beginning, but then it grew and you had a presence all over the world. Now, again, what happens after that success is again very uh, instructive. Because that's when we realize that all this uh, success, name and fame and everything that we get still does not bring a sense of fulfillment. Even after that, we feel that some, still something missing in my life. There's still a gap, there's a void. What is it that is still missing and how can I fill it up? And an enlightened person like you would put the finger at the right place. How is it I can, that I can fill that gap? By giving something which I have in me to those who really need it. And uh, you saw that uh, there is something which the underprivileged and the vulnerable sections of the society need, to whom also you can give something. And that is uh, how you stepped into the area of education and uh, the other areas which, by, through which you could particularly give something to these sections of the society. And that is what brought you that sense of fulfillment. And uh, uh, it was in that role that you could were identified with Yashodama and uh, which truly you were. And again, you brought out something very important in education that uh, when we feel that when children talk or they run around, they're wasting their time or they're being indisciplined, we don't really understand how is it that they learn. Nature has programmed them, them that way because that is their way of learning. They learn so much by doing this. They don't learn by listening to a sermon from the teacher. That's for adults, maybe. Even adults don't learn much from there. In fact, Sri said nothing can be taught, you know, which, of course, I'll not get into that, expanding that. But, uh, and that is how they learn. Because we start with the physical. We start with the vital. Those are our tools of learning to start with. We don't start with the mental. And even modern psychologists like Piaget say that the real mental development starts only after the age of seven. And it's not before 12 that you can really... Uh, indulge in abstract thinking. So we are ignoring the tools of learning that the child has at the age of four when we are trying to uh, tell the child, sit straight, sit on your seat, don't move from your seat, don't talk to your neighbor, don't run around. You know, if we do all that, we are not, we are showing a total misunderstanding of the way the child has been programmed. Nature has programmed him to learn and we are stopping him from doing exactly that. And if you understand the child, then the child is also willing to listen to you a bit. As you said, I mean, then the children enjoy listening to you because this is a person who loves us, whom we can trust. And you build up that 
relationship. And uh, the four-year-old child who left this world before becoming a teenager, one can call it a sort of transcendence before teens, uh, I can imagine and guess who the child is having close connections with the mother's international school and, of course, the child's mother who has now become a very good counselor. And then, again, you did something very uncommon, although not uh, something which nobody has ever done. You shared your, also your attempt at suicide at the age of 16. And that, again, uh, shows that, I mean, how is it that uh, the society creates those pressures uh, which uh, drive us to that, which uh, a sensitive 16-year-old can't take the way Buddha could not handle uh, old age and misery and death and illness and so on. So a 16-year-old uh, being fed a lot on Akbar and Samachar, as you said, gets exposed to things which the 60, a sensitive 16-year-old can't handle. But then, as you said, this was your most uh, successful uh, failure. And uh, what you looked upon in a way as a failure was the success of the divine. Because in the divine scheme, there's nothing like failure. There's only one thing, and that is success. In human terms, we may look, look upon it as a failure, but then how could you die if you were not destined to die? And it's the divine will that ultimately prevails. Sometimes that ultimately is too late. But, but in situations where it would be too late if it is late, divine also knows how to intervene before it is too late. So it is the divine will that prevailed. And in that scheme, it uh, always, uh, there's only one thing and that is success. And uh, how could it be otherwise? Because uh, you had so much to give to the world. You had been brought with that equipment and uh, that could not go to waste. And uh, then, you know, you again brought out one more important thing that uh, taking spiritual messages to different uh, uh, people, to a much larger number of people has become so easy with the internet. And uh, one can again see in it a sort of a hand of the divine because uh, the way we are able to communicate looks nothing short of magic. But yet it is happening, and that's how we feel that it is real. But then if anybody talked about it, and some people did talk about it 100 years ago, it was considered science fiction. Now that science fiction has become a reality today. But then it is helping create that sense of oneness, taking the right messages to those who are receptive to it. And more and more people are receptive because there's an evolutionary thrust, as Sri and the mother have talked about. So that evolutionary thrust is there, and therefore more and more people have that hunger, that aspiration, which of course is timeless. It has always been there in man, that aspiration to go beyond that little self, an aspiration to go into deeper existential questions about who I am, what is my relationship with the creator, if any, and why am I here in this world? Now, this is an, these are questions mankind has asked always. But then more and more people will ask these questions and take these questions seriously. That is the result of the evolutionary thrust. And since the demand is going to be there, the divine has also made sure that the supply will become liberal and very convenient for everybody. So now we can say that this is all taking us towards a better realization, a faster realization than anyone could imagine of the vision of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, that as a result of this development, what will happen is that the number of people with a higher level of consciousness will increase. So the average level of human consciousness will go up. And since human nature depends primarily on the consciousness, the typical human nature will change. Instead of being ego-driven personalities, we'll become love-driven personalities. And that is what will give us a better world. That will be, and that is the only lasting solution we can have to all the problems of human existence, all the misery and suffering and so on, which moves us, which gives us opportunities to give something which we have. But at the same time, that doesn't really solve those problems. The solution will ultimately come from that shift, upward shift in the typical human consciousness and therefore typical human nature. And that is the vision Sri Aurobindo and Nimari gave us. They were the first spiritual masters, in fact, to have as the goal of their spiritual philosophy. Before that, the focus was on the individual. Although, of course, individual is a part of the collective, but they were the ones who, were, who uh, connected the individual to the collective most clearly 
and most definitely and gave us the certitude that this is something will happen that will happen and not too distant a future and what is the tool that they gave us that actually comes towards the end of savitri and that is what came also towards the end of your talk one word love towards the end of savitri there's a small little line to feel love and oneness is to live the very purpose of living really meaningful living for a human being comes from love which has been inspired by oneness to feel love and oneness is to live that is on the very last page of savitri towards the end in that i consider the mahavakya of savitri and that is where you also ended but uh, then there was a question which it seems uh, wanted it to be more complete because yes to feel love inspired by oneness is good and to express that love by giving what we have to those who need it is also good but then how can we really have a sense of oneness which is sustained which sustains longer than it generally does and then you came up with that wonderful list of 10 tools which we can use for uh, experiencing that oneness i think those 10 tools will uh, again remain a very memorable part of what you spoke i could go on and on but then uh, i think i should limit myself before the, the audience runs away uh, so i'll stop here and thank you once again and uh, we would like to have you again for i'm sure you have a lot more within you uh, which came out in the questions and answers but then there's still much more that is waiting to come out you are like that you know uh, balloon uh, which is inflated just a little puncture is needed and you find it a lot comes out like that tsunami you know uh, which uh, knows no end and just flows so that is the sort of uh, person we have discovered through this uh, talk and uh, we will keep uh, bothering you again and again to speak in the near future again and again thank you so much Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zani ji. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm just, I'm not going to take any more time. I know it's already late. But, you know, something that you started with that, yes, when we spoke about this beautiful opportunity, this create, this platform on this day, it was not thought of. And that's what I want to end with that. You know, either everything is a miracle and magic in our life or nothing is. So if we find that connection, we find the beauty, the love, the oneness in our own being and the creation around, with the creation around, we'll get enough opportunities to explore that. So I truly hope that all the beautiful people who are here, we all can together ride and shine and share our energy and uh, allow more and more people to tap into this magic and tap into this miraculous existence of being. Thank you. Thank you. Aapka bohat, bohat shukrana. It's a very, very, very special, very special day for me also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Namika, ma'am, for uh, your beautiful time and presence and so much of elegance and I could just go on. I would also like to thank all the participants for being here with us, although the session, um, you know, went a little longer, but for all of you for being here, we can close today's session now with a moment of peaceful silence. <laughs>